Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Strong Men of God podcast. My name is Bruce. With me again is Mano Gonzalez from prophecywatchers.com or the Prophecy Watchers YouTube channel. Uh, we talked about in the last time we did this about um, talking about Bible prophecy. And I mentioned like, boy, I wish I could just I, I want to dig into it, but I'd like to have somebody who knows a, a lot more than I do about it. And uh, and you volunteered, so I'm taking you up on it. <laughs> Good to be here. It's always fun. <laughs> so, I, and I know a lot of people are probably thinking, uh, I, I kind of live in an area where when when people say prophecy, they're thinking of people that are saying a prophetic word over somebody or something among like that. They're going to... They're predicting future events or whatever, but we're talking Bible prophecy, right? You know, that that's good you bring that up because, you know, interestingly, you know, we have a, you know, I've been here for a year, but the ministry itself has a pretty big footprint through social media and other avenues and, and stuff. But, you know, I'm the one that handles all the questions and answers that come in, yeah. which, which I enjoy. Yeah. And you but do a great job. I would say probably every couple months we, we get an email in that, uh, people say, hey, you know, we appreciate your ministry, uh, but since you're prophecy watchers and you're into the prophets, why don't you take into consideration any of these modern day prophets? What's your opinion? And I go, well, it, it's a very delicate balance because, yeah. um, you know, I don't want to speak evil of anybody and that's not my heart. And I just what I say is, um, you know what, I, I, I used to go down that road. I mean, I'm not. Uh, my first couple of years of my Christian walk, I was in a uh, P- Pentecostal charismatic church. And so I'm not unfamiliar with the way that um, that movement is, is operating in, 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 the, in that regard. So, but I said, look, through the years, what I have found is that uh, even recently with all the dreams and the visions that were going on last year, or really a little longer ago with the election. Yeah. And yeah. so I said, Hey, you have, This group of prophets that are saying that Trump is going to win and he's going to be installed as another term. I mean, they didn't say there was going to be a gap. They said, no, come January 6th of 2021, he's going to continue. And then you have this group of prophets over here that are saying those prophets are wrong. And so obviously these ones over here that said he wasn't going to be in there, which were very few. There were very few of them. So I said, hey, um, these ones over here, which were a lot, I only saw one of them ever said, hey, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I repent. You know, don't stone me. Right. Do it on me. <laughs> yeah. So I said, look, at the end of the day, I don't have time to chase down all of these and try to vet them all because and plus, honestly, at the this is where I come down to it is um, all scriptures inspired. You know, it's profitable for teaching, for doctrine, repute, for correction to make us complete. Second Timothy 3, 16, 17. And then in verse 15, it says, it's able to make you wise in the salvation, Paul's telling Timothy. So for me, I just say the scripture is sufficient. I don't need modern day prophets because if you're telling me I need a modern day prophet, then you're telling me indirectly that the scripture is insufficient for what I need. Yeah, true. And so I don't, for me, I know that the word of God, the, the, all the Old Testament prophets, as well as the New Testament prophets, you know, Paul was a prophet, Peter obviously prophesied. So I said, that has been locked in scripture. It's canonical. It's been around. It is vetted. It has been proven trustworthy. I don't need to go anywhere else. It's sufficient for me. Mm-hmm. So that that's it. And I go, I'm not speaking evil of anybody. Well, do you think they're true? You know what? I don't even, it's none of my business. I'm just telling you what I tell people is stick with the scripture. You'll never go wrong there. Yep. It'll yep. never leave you astray. It has been shown to be true and reliable and trustworthy, and that's enough to keep you busy. Yeah, and there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of prof. There's a lot of prophecy in the Bible that hasn't yet happened. Agreed. Yeah. So there's there's a lot. There's already a lot there. I, I mean, to, and now to go look for you know the latest word or whatever is, I, I agree with you. you. You that could be all you do. Is just chasing down, but I think sometimes people are looking for they're looking for a word for themselves. They're looking they are. for verification of what's going, what they think, it, and that's kind of hard because it's not like we talked about last time. It's not about us, yeah. you know. It, it, it's about Jesus, and there's so many things that it feels like we're on the edge of right now. Yeah. I mean, there's stuff going on in Israel um, 
But, well, there's, stuff, there's always stuff going on in Israel, mm-hmm. you know, but I, I remember, I think it was Chuck Missile that said, you know, Israel is God's timepiece. Yeah. You know, we That's look to Israel to to what's happening and where we are, you know, in in, in, in the end times or just in general, you know. So no, that's probably, uh, you know, that's probably a good place to start in the sense of for those, you know, men that are looking into this, you know, it comes back to the the foundation of what I see out there is a the confusion. Even, you know, I've been looking at prophecy for 30 years, but um, there, there's all these there's a, there's a lot of terminology. There's premillennial, yeah. there's postmillennial, there's amillennial, there's preterist, partial preterist, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, uh, pre-wrath, <laughs> partial yeah. rapture. I mean. There's a lot of language out there, so it does take a little bit to get into it. But what I have found is, you know, are all partial predators pagan? No, not at all. They're brothers in the Lord. They love yeah. Jesus. Uh, those that are post-millennial, all those, all the others, um, they're, they're brothers. I think that what I find to be the, the, the main defining, um, you know, thing that separates them all is just what we discussed a couple minutes ago. How straightforward or how literal do you take the Bible? And so what you, what I find is when people start um, in consistency, uh, many people start figuratively taking scripture without allowing it to speak. Or maybe they, you know, it's, for example, I'll give you one example, which I, I'm fighting against. People, I get people <laughs> sending in their emails and they're like, hey, Mondo, you, you need to hear this. And it's a word from the Lord from somebody. But they're coming in and they're pulling out Daniel chapter two or not chapter two, chapter seven and eight, where it's talking about the leopard and the bear. And they're like, this is clearly the Ukrainian world war because of the bear reference there. Yeah. And so they take it with Russia as being the bear. And, and I just, I respond and I go, what, you know, in, in interpreting the Bible hermeneutics, you got to take things in their context and the context of Daniel seven and eight is not at all modern day Russia. But secondly, um, I think the more that we figure t- figuratively or spiritualize or uh, typology, the more we do that, the more we get with some of these really, I would say, very far out there interpretations. We take the Bible straightforward unless it tells us. I, an example, I think we might have talked about this last time, but in Revelation chapter 12, I saw a sign in heaven you know, a woman clothed with 12 stars, you know, and a sun and moon, or I saw a sign in heaven, a dragon. Okay, well, he's telling you, I see a sign. So that helps us to, to know that that sign is not literal, but it's pointing to something literal. That's yeah. what signs and symbols do. So I yeah. think it's, if anybody's looking into learning more about prophecy, and, and this is what I would lead with, is that if you look at the prophecies of Jesus's first coming, Micah 5, 2 is an example, says that he was going to be born in Bethlehem. That wasn't spiritual. That wasn't figurative. Mm-hmm. He was born in Bethlehem. You know, uh, in Isaiah 7, 14, he's going to be born of a virgin. That was very literal. So when you look at the, the, the dozen or two or three dozen that are very clear prophecies of Jesus' first coming, all of them, all of them are refer, especially if you look at the New Testament, the way that they, they phrase it, they were interpreted literally. Now, there's only there's one. Okay, I'll give you one that that isn't. But in the book of Matthew, chapter 2, you have Matthew writing about G- Jesus and the Magi and, and, and coming Jesus' mm-hmm. birth. And it says, and then they go down into Egypt. And then when they come back out, it says, thus it was fulfilled, out of Egypt I shall call my son. That's a quote from Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. But what the reason why this is very unusual well there you go mondo there's an example of this <laughs> figurative and i go well however um i would agree with you in principle so if you're going to take this one and you're going to bankrupt all the other literalness of all the other prophecies that's a little difficult for me but the reason if you study the context of the book of matthew the whole gospel he is he is presenting jesus as the new israel the the obedient israel the personification of Israel, like you see in Romans 11, where Paul says, well, what's the benefit of Israel? Well, they have the covenants, they have the promises, they have the fathers, but they also have the Messiah. So Mm -hmm. the Messiah is the epitome of Israel. And so Matthew's presenting Jesus as the epitome of Israel. For example, I'll just give you one little example, is in, in, um, in ancient times, 
we know that Israel spent 38 years in the desert, right? Wandering in the 40, 38 literal years, but 40 total But by the time they left in Deuteronomy chapter 2. So they're in the wilderness, and we know that they fail. They're tested, tested, tested. You just read the book of Deuteronomy, and they failed. Well, how does Matthew start his gospel? Out of Egypt, I've called my son. Oh, by the way, he brings up Jesus going out into the te- into temptation in the wilderness to be tempted. And what does Jesus do? Satan tempts him. He quotes the book of Deuteronomy 6 through 8, the exact passages that refer to the wilderness wandering. Mm. So it's like you have old Israel failing. You have Jesus, the new Israel, and he obeys and he wins and he succeeds in temptation by quoting the word exactly from the passages that they should have known. So if you take the one passage that could be considered typological, you say, well, that's Matthew's bringing a theology in. But the rest of it is he was born of a virgin. So start. Yeah. Being literal. Literal. Sorry, that's kind of long winded, but that's (laughs) the foundation that everybody needs. Yeah. Yeah. And. um. Let me, let me ask you a question <clears throat> from from your perspective, your pastoral perspective, and you're just and you you're a wealth of knowledge in the Bible. But I mean, as far as as far as and, I, and we're going to relate this to men, you know, and but this relates to everybody. I mean, I to me, Bible prophecy is important, but like for a lot of people who are, ah, oh, it's not that big of a deal. It's just you know, it's another, it's a small part of the Bible. Why why should we even care? Um, what what would you say to something like that when somebody's like, you know, yeah, there's other things we could spend our time on. We don't really need to dig into this. We don't really need to know it. You know, it's it. it I I I know what I would probably say, but I mean, I'm just curious what you would. You know, I wrote. I don't have it memorized, but I wrote an article a few years ago about why to study prophecy. I'll see if I can remember how many I can remember, but um, <laughs> you know. It is very true that somebody doesn't need to ever study prophecy um, in order to be a, a Bible-believing, solid Christian. To be saved. It's not, a, saved. It's not a doctrinal yeah, nope. I mean, a foundation. Yeah. Yep. But you, you made reference to it last time, is that in the Matthew 16 passage where Jesus scolded the Pharisees for not discerning the signs of the times, um, in the same way— um, one of one of my motto verses is Mark thirteen thirty seven, where Jesus is is giving um, his his description of the end times, the Olivet discourse. And in that mm-hmm. passage, after he gets all done with giving all the signs of the disciples, it, it's not just to them because he says, "What I say to you, I say to all. Watch." So we have a command by Jesus Himself in Mark thirteen thirty seven to be watching. So I guess. It's hard to say that, well, what am I watching? Uh, to be an obedient Christian, if you want to follow Jesus's command there, then you would say, well, I want to be an obedient Christian, then I need to watch. Now, again, um, I would encourage people, if they only had a certain amount of time and they were, I would rather have them study and put into practice what it means to be a loving Christian, what it means to be a humble Christian or a faithful, obedient Christian. You know, I know, understand, not everybody's called to be a professional, you know, uh, theologian in that regard. But I would say, hey, in some way, studying prophecy shows us the reliability of Scripture because we see Jesus' first coming. That's, That's very true. Yep. Th- that helps solidify it's a, a kind of apologetic. So if you if you do this, number one, it helps you with evangelism. I mean, do you care about those that you love? Right now is probably the best time it's ever been. And so I think it's only going to get better in the sense of using or t- looking at our world events and sharing them with others, you know, family, friends, neighbors, workers, co-workers, etc. about, hey, what do you think is going on? And then being knowledgeable enough to point them, this Bible has talked about this for a long time. Really? It has? Yeah. And God is God shares these things in order for you to know and to be saved. Um, I think in 1 John 3, two, verse 2, it talks about those that have the hope of Jesus' second coming, um, about being holy. I mean, the, the parables that Jesus gives in the Olivet Discourse, among a couple, a couple other places, about his return, about watching, is if you are, I mean, you, you could not know anything about prophecy and still be living life as a solid believer and be ready. Jesus is going to come whenever he does, but I'm going to be ready. Okay, that's true. But there is something to say about being knowledgeable about the current events or world events and going, man, I want to be ready at, at a moment's notice. There's another passage, too, that, that has spoken to my heart through the years is 2 Timothy 4.8, where it says that those who love his appearing— 
in the sense of anticipating his appearing, mm -hmm. will receive a crown. Yeah. yeah. And not every, I mean, I believe even if people are a true solid believer, even if they're not looking or not, even though they don't know anything about prophecy or they have bad theology, they're going to go up in the rapture. I don't believe in the partial rapture garbage. Um, don't believe that. They're going to go up, but they're going to go, oh, wow, I really wasn't expecting it. <laughs> now, will they receive the crown? According to that passage, maybe not. But um, so we're called to to be watching, to be ready. Jesus said that in Luke 21. Hey, always pray. You know, don't get caught up in carousing and drunkenness. There's the holiness, the, the obedience living. Pray that you would be found worthy by the blood um, to escape all these things which are coming to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke 21, 34 through 36. So you have these, these passages that Jesus yep. is yep. telling us, this is, hey, guys, you're my kids. Um, this is what's awaiting you. Be on the lookout. Uh, and even more so, right, Hebrews 10, even more so as the day continues to get closer and closer. And, and you know, for me, part of that is, you know, one of the things that Jesus say, what he says when he's talking to his disciples about when they're asked, well, what are the signs of the time? You know, what uh, the signs of the times at the end of the age? One of the first things Jesus says is don't be deceived. Yeah. And uh, And he says that. He had said that a lot, so I'm like, it, but we can see all the deception around us now. I mean, and I'm probably going to keep getting worse. Yeah. But for me, if you don't know the signs of the times and what the Bible says, it's it would be really easy to be deceived, yeah. and then you're now on the wrong track. You're following maybe somebody who's claiming to be a a Christ, you know, type, or you know, maybe not directly claiming that, but with progressive Christianity and some of the other stuff that's going on now, they're really, I, I, what is their word? Deconstructing. Yes. They are really deconstructing people's faith and they're putting doubt in, into their faith and probably leading lots of people astray and maybe to where they renounce their, yeah. their, their belief in Jesus. And, and to me, it's about just not, not wanting to be deceived and, um, and digging into these things that Jesus wants us about. You know, and and also to me, it's it, like you said, it's validation. It's it's when God said this is going to happen, and it happens. Like when Israel became a nation, you know, we knew all the stuff in the end times. Like there was going to be a temple, and Jesus is coming. And but but when there was no Israel, that, that was impossible for it to happen. Then all of a sudden, there's an Israel. You know, after you know, thousands of years. So I mean, that that's it. That's, that's a good. I'm glad you brought that up because. Um, I wrote an article, I don't know, probably about eight or nine months ago where I had always wanted to do this, but um, where I, I, I went back and I, I have lots of commentaries. I mean, um, <laughs> I just do and uh, thousands of commentaries. And but I decided to go back and one of the, the, the collections that I have is some of the more what they call classic commentaries. So some of the basic texts like Ezekiel 37, the dry bones vision, Deuteronomy 30, you know, Isaiah chapter 11. There's all these passages that speak about Israel's return. So I was like, OK, let's go back and look at what John Calvin said, you know, about Ezekiel and others. And so you look at the reformers and others, even going all the way up to a couple hundred years ago. And what you find is they spiritualize everything. Yeah. And and so here you are dealing with these passages. And again, I'm not picking on them because for them, Israel had been gone, dustbin of history for 1,500 years. What do they know? And, yeah, but, they don't see how it could happen. Yeah. Nope. And the distinguishing factor. And then what I also did, though, to, to as I was building up the, kind of the culmination, this article is on our website. If you go to prophecywatchers.com and go to articles, you'll find it on there talking. And the title is. Uh, Israel, uh, why we're watching Israel ground zero, kind of going back to Missler's comment mm. uh, about being the timepiece. But after I went through the the a half a dozen commentaries showing how they spiritualize it and there's nothing to see here, I went to some other commentaries which were dispensational. And, and that's not, uh, I don't say that because I believe everything that dispensationalism says necessarily. But what they did is I went to the com commentaries that were some from like 1855, uh, early 1900, 1916, Clarence Larkin, some of these other guys, where they took the Bible straight forward, literally. And they're like, hey, we don't know how it's going to happen, but Israel's coming back as a nation. That's what the Bible says. Yeah, it has to, yeah. It has to be. We have yeah. no idea. When we look out, there's no way. It's a graveyard <laughs> of nations. The, Clarence Larkin, was a, he was a good um, 
language, euphemism, the graveyard of nations, but out there, God's going to raise them up. And so you take those and you go, okay, guys, if you take the figurative way, you're going to have mud on your face. If you take it straightforward and let the Bible say what it's going to say, you're going to be vindicated. So as we look forward to, um, they looked forward to 1948 and no doubt that there it was, voila, a nation becomes out of the, out of the graveyard. And, and they knew it was going to happen based on scripture. As we look back, we go, man, here's the verification. And so as we look forward now for us, more of the things that are coming to be in the end times, um, we're going to take things straight forward. I mean, and, and as we watch, it's amazing that we're not going to spiritualize it away because I don't want mud on my face. But it's consistent with the first coming. And here we are seeing already the second coming prophecies. It's exciting. Okay. I'm going <clears> to <throat> I'm going to pick your brain. And I'm going to put you on the spot. Isaiah 17. Are we in the middle of that right now? I actually think we are. Now, I'm not saying it's happening next week, but Isaiah 17 is talking about the destruction of Damascus. And I would say that what we're seeing right now is is absolutely contributing to what's going on. Even even the like people ask about Ukraine. I'll bring it all together is Mondo is what's going on in Ukraine prophetic. I go, well, not directly, but what it's doing, and I'm, I'm going to probably do a program on this soon, is what we're seeing is the way in which Russia, if you, if you remember early on that the war started mm-hmm. in February, March, April, it's interesting that who was the one nation that was trying to bring peace between Ukraine and, and, uh, and Russia? It was Israel. Israel. Yeah. Came in, yeah. Naftali <clears throat> Bennett was asking, hey, he was he was part of this three-way conversation. Well, since then, um, Israel and Russia are absolutely at odds around Russia's, uh, Russia's certainly activities in Ukraine, but secondly, Israel's activities in Syria, which, of course, involves Damascus, its capital. So mm-hmm. right now, just yesterday, um, Russia has stepped up uh, state-sanctioned anti-Semitism. Now, so... When you Mm. look at these things, to see Russia and Israel, which had been friendly for the last few years, all of a sudden within a few months have this tremendous acrimony and tension. And that is that prophetic. It is absolutely prophetic in the sense it's contributing to these Eco 38 situation. And then Israel signed an agreement with Europe just a few weeks ago about providing them gas from their Tamar and their Leviathan fields. I mean, you can't can't make it up. The spoils that Russia and everybody's yes. coming for, not only just to wipe out Israel, but I think that's part of the spoils. Because now, I mean, Russia is turning off the gas to Europe as Israel is stepping up and being able to provide. Uh, yeah, I can I can see a lot of contention there, and that's setting up Ezekiel 38. Which, um, again, I think is, is preceded by the Isaiah 17. It's really hard for the timing on that. Um, I just, to me, it's like it's it's kind of has, we did on another podcast. We did one called prophecy in slow motion, yeah. and it's like it's coming to pass. It's, it's it's just not going to happen. Maybe in a day, and maybe it will. We don't know, but it's 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 being destroyed kind of as we speak. Um, yeah, the, the 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 at least the language, which again hindsight prophecy is generally hindsight. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. get it. But it the language of Isaiah, Isaiah seventeen seems to be that it is completely wiped out to such a degree, possibly by a nuclear strike. Sounds like don't, it. Don't know that for sure. But yep. nevertheless, um, what we're watching now with the tension, because Israel cannot stop um, protecting itself by bombing these things in the in the country of Syria. They can't. They can't. It, even, yeah. under, even under Russian threat. Russia's threatening them to pr- bring in the S-400 missiles, the anti-aircraft you know uh, aircraft missiles. Um, but I think Israel's like, look, we make we make no agreements with anybody because at the end of the day, they know that they they have to rely on themselves. So even under threat of from Russia, they're they're going to bomb Iran. That's it's in the works. They're, they have to take those out. Um, they're going to continue to bomb the, the the weapons that are coming across through Syria into Hezbollah and into, into Lebanon. They they have to. Yeah, and and I and somebody I don't remember who it was mentioned that. You know, it, this isn't going to be the down. The the Ukrainian war is not going to be the downfall of Russia, because we know Russia's there. Excuse me, bless you. Um, 
because we know Russia's there in the end times with Ezekiel yeah. 38. So Russia's not, they're not going anywhere and they're, if anything, going to be a, still a superpower. Oh yeah, you know? they're not, they're not so, losing. So, right so now. Ukraine, and I, I honestly think we're, we're kind of seeing the process of the downfall of NATO, which may bring up some kind of European Union defense force thing, which may be a revived Roman emperor. I don't, you know, we just don't know, but we, it's interesting to see what's happening all over the world. Um, quick question to you. Do you think it may end up being, uh, and we don't know about Isaiah 17, but like a Psalm 83 that leads into a Ezekiel 38 or, yeah, I, you know, and is I'll that all this. kind of pre-trib or there, yeah. Oh, absolutely. We we okay. just Bill Solace and I we just did a um, a four part DVD series that that we were just getting ready to do it. And we talked about Jeremiah forty nine, the the Elam invasion, which yep. is southwestern Iran, which leads into a Psalm eighty three uh, war, which precipitates the Isaiah seventeen situation, and then all that is building up to the Ezekiel thirty eight situation. So. There's there's these outliers, the, what we what we're calling pre-tribulational wars, that is not Armageddon. It's the 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 DVD is called the Road to Armageddon, but the pre-tribulational wars. So some of these, um, I would expect the church to be here 100% to see them, uh, and so we we outline the the possible. We're not we're not prophets, but we do have the prophetic material, and we're trying the best that we can to provide a coherent logical biblical consistency picture of yeah, how it what, could play out yep 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 yeah and 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 to me i can see and again we don't know um but i can see ezekiel 38 happening before before the tribulation even maybe before rapture pre the yep. pre-trib rapture only in the sense that this is such a, a an action taken by god that there's no other there's no other explanation as to how israel won this and it's going to bring a lot of people. It's going to open a lot of eyes that this this was. It's going to be explained away, but we know this is going to be. A lot of people will see it as a, what it was a supernatural event, and I think that's going to. A lot of Christians that are kind of eh, on the fence about whether they whatever it's going to cement them on the side of Jesus, and it's going to bring other peoples to faith because they're going to see this miraculous thing. And I just think it's 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 God's doing it for Himself. But I think it's also going to bring a lot of people to salvation, too. You know, I'll say this, that I'm um, – that's my hope. I, I, yeah. I share a little bit of caution, and here's why. is because I think of in, in Matthew chapter 11 where Jesus is in chapter 12, those two chapters, where he's talking about – he's bringing down judgment on Cortazine and Capernaum and Bethsaida. And he says, you know, hey – if the miracles done, if the miracles that I did in you were done in Sodom and Gomorrah or in Tyre, they, you know, they would have repented. So I'm, I'm reluctant in just thinking that yeah. a miracle will produce faith because we know that whether it's the Exodus, grand miracles, we have a bunch of rebels. <laughs> they're worshiping a golden calf, you know, a few weeks later. Jesus does thousands, thousands of miracles and goes, you guys are going to get it worse. So, well, and Jesus did all those miracles, and then they still asked him for a sign. Yeah, they still asked him for a sign. <laughs> so, I, my hope is always that God does often use miracles to bring revival, but we don't trust in those, uh, yeah. certainly, because again, Jesus is the best example. He did thousands, and they still re re rejected him. And see, we don't think in terms like that because I think in our modern culture, we we think we think in terms of of atheism versus theism that, well, if you're not an atheist, then you're a theist. But in Jesus's day, I mean, they knew that Jesus was from God, but they just rejected God. Yeah. So, I mean, they, they even, I think in Acts chapter four, when after that, the Peter and John get beat up and they, they come back and it says, they knew that they, that they had been with Jesus. <laughs> so it's like they affirmed the resurrection, like, yeah, but we don't care because they wanted their power their authority structure, and they didn't want to lose it. So you think, really? These people knew that God existed? Yeah, they did, and they rejected him. I mean, again, think about the wilderness generation, Yeah, that you have all the miracles, there's Yahweh, and yet you go worship a golden calf, and you think, oh. Uh, I, well, that kind of shows human nature a little bit there. It does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I I don't know. I mean, I, I would – I kind of have my own thoughts on how maybe things will line up, and, but I'm willing to be uh, not, you know, this has to be this way or, or you know, whatever. I, I 
I, I'm, I'm will, I, I honestly don't know enough. And, and I think to anybody say that they know exactly what God's going to do is kind of kidding themselves. You know, we just, we're not there. We're not, we're not. I'm dogmatic about the gospel and pretty much nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Because we look and we go, Hey, this is the best, you know, I've tried to study and research and to say, Lord, I'm trying and to look at all and see all the perspectives and be able to explain each perspective, you know, and be fair with them. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, I land somewhere. I land in a pre-trip position uh, that's pre-millennial that and I land there. And to, I think, I know I'm the same as you because that makes more sense to me. It does going to me. through everything. It just that yep. to me makes more sense of to what the purpose of the tribulation is for. Agreed. Yeah. Um, and, and once you understand that, to me, and again, I'm not a theologian, but to me, once you understand really what it's for, there's no purpose for the church to go through that because we've already been redeemed. So it's yeah. like we don't need to go through the fire to, you know, to to be refined because um, we're we're just not we're not going to get personally we're just not going to get better than what Jesus has already done for us, you know, in in God's Agreed. eyes, and that's that's my stance. So um, there's not a purpose for the church to be there. Um, yeah. And there's, is there going to be people who think they're Christians that actually end up there because oh, they're not really? I mean, yeah. See, that's a not, great. I'm glad you said that because oftentimes, um, you know, Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, right? And he's yeah, saying, depart from me. Verse. I never knew you. It's not like I knew you and you lost it. You renounced me. I never knew you. So Titus 1, 16, another passage, it's just like comes, it's a... Hey, they yeah. they profess to know God, but in their works they deny Him. So you have this consistency there that hey, I don't read hearts. I don't pretend to read hearts. I mean, I know what the Bible says. Only God sees the heart. So if someone says they're a Christian, are they? I don't know. I can only yeah. go by their testimony and what they say, and maybe their fruit. Right? You'll know them by yeah. their fruits, yeah. or you have yeah. other passages. Yeah. Without faith, without works is dead. But. Are there going to be people that claim to be Christians that are left behind? Yes. Are there going to be any true, genuine Christians from God's perspective left behind? No. They're going to all be taken up. I have no problem with that. And so I think at the end of the day, Jesus is telling us over and over to watch, to watch, to be ready, to be found faithful, to when he arrives, will you be looking? Like, you know, the thief, if you're ready for the thief, man, you're not being surprised. So that language, that language that Jesus used about the thief, Paul used it as well in 1 Thessalonians 5. Yeah. It's meant for the believer. It's not, the warning isn't going out to the to the unbeliever. They don't care. But it's saying, if you're ready, that when Jesus comes, you're going to go, man, I didn't know the exact day, but I was ready because I knew he was coming soon. Because why? I was watching. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, no, oh, I lost my train of thought there, but it was on the oh, it was on the rapture, on the pre-trip rapture, um, or just the rapture in general. And I had heard some teaching once that talked about you know maybe this is a rewards thing, you know, for the Christians who aren't, who you know the ones that aren't really doing anything, they're not going to get that reward like some of the crowns. Uh, I I can kind of see that a little bit, but then it comes down to like what's the what's the standard. What's that level of where you're good enough to to get that reward? And I think that's for me where it came down to be. It has to be for every Christian. It can't be for a select few because what, what what's that cutoff? You know, you and, know, and and would you be like, God, I missed that by thirty seconds? No, Do you know you what I mean? It's like, see, you're you're thinking through because that's the exact the, the, that's the logic because um, we have people yeah. write in and they're like. I can't believe you guys don't teach on the partial rapture theory. It's it's kind of becoming or those that are obedient. Jesus said those that are already like the five, the ten virgins, the five oh, yeah, foolish yeah. ones. And they, they try to take these, and I don't think that's what it, th- those mean. But I'll be like, hey, what's this? I use the same language. What's the standard? Did, did I miss it by a half a percent? And, and yeah, now yeah. There, it's did, this. Did I just miss one person I didn't talk to that I yep. should have, and then now. It's this ethereal, elusive, you, you know, you trying to grab it. I mean. And then you go, if you ask 20 people who believe in this in this theory, you're going to get 20 different perspectives because some of them say, oh, you know what? It's the, the Sabbath day, you know, or, you know, you got to keep kosher. Yeah. You, know, you have all these these other you things. Got legalism that, that, that gets in there. That yes. we've got it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, I will say this. The hard though. part for me is like, well, and I don't remember who said that, but it was somebody that said, you know, then what is the standard? How do you how do you know you're measuring up? How do you know you're going to go? You're not going to go. And then it, and then you start going into questioning your faith. Are you good enough 
are you really a Christian? Are, you know, and then and then you start this whole doubt and it, it's not going anywhere good. So that's no. why I and, and maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But it doesn't make sense that that's the way it would be. No, because I, I don't think you're wrong at all. And this I. Because to the gospel for me is that the gospel is is salvific it saves it, there's no doubt uh, yeah. now people first john 320 is a great passage where it says if 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 we if our heart condemns us god is greater than our heart so we have this this theology that comes thanks sir we have this theology that comes that that affirms our salvation in what jesus did and yeah we all go back and forth and and there's some people who are saved that don't think they are but they've true and so they're just they're, they're they haven't wrestled with the text enough to have that that full and assurance that we the, theologians talk about assurance of salvation, but it comes back to First Corinthians three. First Corinthians three is a great passage speaking about that day, about the different rewards, the wood, hay, and stubble. We're going to provide it. Yep. And if it goes through the fire, that the, the, our wood, hay, and stubble are those things that we did with the wrong motives or whatever uh, that it's going to get burned up. And in First Corinthians chapter four. Paul is saying, hey, don't judge anything before the time because I don't even know my own motives sometimes, but the Lord will judge my motives on that day. So he's very consistent. But in that passage, chapter three, there, there's going to be some of these things that we do in our service and our love for the Lord that we're going to get rewarded for. But our salvation, man, it's done by Jesus Christ. But it does say some are going to be there as through the fire. They're going to like by the the skin, the hair on their chinny chin chin, chin <laughs> just, the, the, by the blood of Jesus, they're there, but yeah. they have nothing to offer, and it's it's it, and they're gonna smell like smoke. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I remember somebody said, you know the 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 lowest the lowest part of the lowest level in heaven is much greater than the highest level you could attain in hell. Do you know what I mean? It's yes, <laughs> even if you just barely get in, you're in. You know, I mean, you're that, in. That, that that that's the place you want to be when all is said and done. So know. the for those that are out there, and again, this is great for prophecy. So we're talking to men, is hey guys, you know, as you think about and you solidify your own salvation, there's two passages that come to mind is in John 1930, right? He's on the cross, it is finished. It's paid for to tell us die in the Greek. It's a it's a word that's well known in legal transaction, debt is paid. Well then he turns over right before that and he says to the thief, you're going to be today. You're going to be with me in paradise. Yeah. What did that guy do? That guy didn't do anything except. And all he said was, I'm a sinner. He was talking to the other guy and he says, remember me. He acknowledged his sin and he asked Jesus to remember him. That was sufficient. Now, granted, I would tell anybody, don't stay there. If you die, <laughs> then, you know, but don't stay there. But that yeah. that's that's talking mustard seed. And it was sufficient. He was with Jesus paid for full. Yeah. Yeah. Phew. Man, I, this isn't quite exactly where I was thinking we might go with this whole talk of prophecy, but I think it's great, though, because I think we're bringing up some really good points. And to I, I guess what I what I would hope that people would do is 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 think about your faith. Think about uh, what do you really believe and why do you believe it? Because I think a lot of people have an idea of what Christianity is, but they don't know why they believe that. And it's because somebody told them something or they heard this in church or somebody on YouTube said this. And it's a bunch, it's a mishmash of parts and pieces. And, and it really there, in some cases, I'm not saying everybody does this, but in some cases you're making up your own God. Yeah. You're taking the good parts of this and good parts. Oh, Jesus would never do that. You know, that's not, my, we, we had a person come in once and we said something and that, well, my Jesus wouldn't do that. And it took us back. We're like, it says in the Bible, and he and he said, "Well, my Jesus wouldn't do that." And we like, have you ever read the Bible? No, but my Jesus wouldn't do that. He would not condemn somebody who's never done. It. And I'm like, so it was really tough to talk to him because he had in his head yeah. what he believed this was all about and eternal life and who Jesus is. And it was just something that he. This is his personal Jesus that he made up and. You know, and, and it's really hard to tell somebody you're wrong. This isn't what the Bible well, says. But in that instance, it was very clear. Yeah, that this whatever he the person he was talking about was not saved, but he believed they were going to go to heaven because his Jesus wouldn't do that. You know, the 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 best passage that comes to mind is Second Corinthians eleven, where Paul is describing, and, and we know the passage. If if Satan appears as an angel of light, right? Yeah. But in that passage, he talks about 
another Jesus, that people will preach another Jesus, a different Jesus. Yeah. And so you have or, the or ab- absolute phraseology there that, hey, dude, the Jesus that you're preaching is not the real Jesus. And and and, and I preached a sermon years ago, and, and I, it was it was about uh, don't get caught up into having a buffet religion. Oh, I like a little <laughs> bit of that, a little bit of this. I like this, yeah. Yep. Because to me, if, if normally speaking, if I'm going to a buffet, I'm going to go to the meat and I'm going to go to the dessert. I'm going to skip the vegetables. <laughs> but the vegetables are the things that are good for you that we know. They don't always taste as good as the cake. But the vegetables, which are true and they're, they're new, they have a lot of nutrition, is, is like, hey, Jesus does judge. He's, he's the one that Paul said is going to uh-huh. be brought and, and be the, God, the one that God uses on the day. And so – if you're going to dismiss Jesus, you're going to be missing your vegetables and you're going to pay for that because not only that are you going to pay for it yourself, but you're not preaching a false Jesus because Jesus says very clearly in John 5, God has committed all the judgment to the son. Yeah. He is the judge, right? Revelation 20, 20 the great white throne. There he is. And you're like, yeah, I, it's not to be trifled with. Yeah. And I, I that's boy, that's a whole nother topic because people can't see. Jesus as being judge, but we know God is just, uh, and we know these things are going to happen. They have to happen. I mean, but they just, they can't see that Jesus is the one that's going to do it. And I remember hearing a story once of, um, and then this might've been in seminary that there was a bunch of different, I almost think it was denominational leaders, you know, uh, at a con- con- convention or something. And they, they were talking about the different as- attributes of, of Jesus. And somebody brought up the fact that he was judge. And they were like, oh, no, 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 no. You know, they really poo-pooed this whole thing. And they were like, no, that's not something we can ever preach and blah, blah, blah. It, it, because that, their perception was, you know, Jesus is love. He's kind. He turns the other cheek. And it, 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 which is all true. I mean, the part of this is, is a lot of people don't understand is, yeah, that's true, but there's more. He's so much more than what we can even imagine. So it, well, it was just interesting to hear that because that's right in Scripture. That he couple, is, you said it right. You asked, you asked the guy the perfect question. Do you read the Bible? Because if you don't, where do you get your truth? Yeah. And, and it, if it's just out there, again, we have the Word of God, which has been – this is, again, bringing it back to prophecy. It's I would tell people in a man, hey – Make sure that you get the gospel figured out. Become yes, solid yes. in your understanding of the gospel, not only for you, for your wife, for your family, uh, for your kids, for your relatives. But then as you study prophecy, your 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 faith and your trust in the word of God in general is going to increase because you're going to start with the gospel. Again, I would say, hey, don't go master the book of Revelation until you got the gospel figured out. That's for sure. Get the gospel figured out. Yeah. Yeah. And but as you as you go branch outward, um prophecy is gonna absolutely affirm what you you're putting your entire life faith. I know I have my my whole life has been changed because of the gospel and I've given everything I have to it. So I certainly don't want to be wrong, but I'm also interested in facts. I don't just I'm not like I'm not speaking evil necessarily, but I have a lot of friends who are Mormon I remember one time because I have I have archaeology in the background and I was at dinner one time and they said, you know, hey, Mondo, why don't you believe the Book of Mormon? And I was like, oh, oh no, I, I go, don't want to go there. Yeah, I go. Hey, look, you know. I said, uh, you know, I, I believe the Bible is the word of God for archaeology and other reasons and, and it's all prophecy. I said, but uh, Joseph Smith was a false prophet. I mean, Doctrine and Covenants 84, he prophesied that there was going to be a temple, and, and, and it's, it's not there. He prophesied several other things that didn't happen. And the Book of Mormon has no archaeological context at all, ever. I go, so, you know, I've honestly, I would have no problem believing the Book of Mormon if it was true, if it reflected accurate historical reality, and it does not. I go, mm-hmm. hey, I'm not trying to be mean, but you asked me. And so, yeah. it, it's to me, it's it's a complete fabrication, where the you can you can't I mean you can't go to the the Bible lands and dig almost anywhere without having some correlation to biblical history. Yeah, find a coin of King David or Solomon or it's something. It's like it, it's, it's a mate. Yep, it's there. I mean, yeah, yeah. That that would be tough to start that conversation. Yep, and <laughs> like then you opened they up they that started it. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh. Can we do it after dessert? I really want the dessert. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but no, I totally agree with you because I think once you start to dive into this and you start looking, it it reaffirms 
the New Testament to the Old Testament, that the book, it's, it's uh, New Testament churches are kind of, to me, odd when you want to unhitch from the Old Testament and you don't care what the Old Testament says because it's all through. You know, Jesus is all through the whole Bible. But when you dig into prophecy and you think of and, and it's Jesus' own words, he's talking about Isaiah. He's talking, you know what I mean? It, it's all in there. And when you're talking about prophecy, it it just confirms your faith and your belief in who Jesus is, who that he was told from thousands of years ago he was coming. And, and yes. it's foretold he's coming again. And I mean, if you believe the prophecies that he came the first time, that he actually was here, then why not the second time? And then and then why not dig into well, what it's going to be like? What what's what's that all about? And and dig into that. And to me, it, it really does build your faith and your trust that the you know the word is true. The word is true. I mean, and, and it just it, it just I, is. And then the, when you come to that realization is. that God is God, He's real, then you're like, oh man. And that's what happened to me. How I became a Christian. I don't never told I don't tell many people this, but mine came through a uh, creation ministry. That I watched some, and I kind of thought it was more of a joke, and I watched it, and I'm like, man, I've been told a lie this whole time. You know, when you grow up in, you know, uh, in in just a normal state-run school, secular school, or yeah. private school, you're never taught creation. You don't know anything about that. And then when you, and then when you get a little background in the sciences and stuff, and you kind of understand how things work, and then you see that they have no answer for these things how they came about. When somebody points it all out, you're like, oh, it's got to be true. Just and at that point, you got to start digging. You got to start like, well, if I, if this is true, then I need to know, I need to know more. And then yeah. you start digging and that's, that's what happened to me. So I love it, science, man. There's no, I mean, uh, too often we, it was just, you know, I've been a youth pastor again, pastoring, but youth pastor, I was always out for the teens. I wanted their, I wanted their minds. And I was like, Hey, I know this is what you're hearing at school, but let me tell you, we have nothing to be afraid of. You know, one of my favorite examples is, is, um, Dr. Mary Schweitzer, who back 2005, 2008, um, she discovers soft dinosaur, soft tissue and yeah, dinosaur bones. Yeah. And you're like, Oh, that blew everybody out though. Yeah. yeah and and it's funny, it's just, she got attacked over and over and over and then all these people did their own research and i think she by the time she's like I, i've done the, the the experiment 17 times hey i don't know what to tell you but it's interesting that they didn't change their mindset on on the on the nature of the dinosaurs they said well there's some process that uh keeps preserved living tissue it's like for 50 million years <laughs> we don't know it yet and you're like what's the obvious that may, they didn't live you know i mean yeah. that, here's the evidence in yeah. your face and you simply refuse and then that kind of goes back to what you said about like in jesus time they knew they, they knew. knew god they just they just refused to yeah, they acknowledge see. him yeah what does roman say the creation the invisible of god clearly show but they suppress the truth and yeah. unrighteousness and you're like and what professor we're kind of living advice. romans one we're kind of living Romans one now. We are. We? we are living Romans one. <laughs> we are. We're we're Not in the middle people. of that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so a hey, well, I'm I'm probably gonna have to cut this short because I could probably we could probably go on because I'd love to get some information like what do you think about this with uh, Psalm eighty three? What do you think about this? And is there other than you know Isaiah and Psalm eighty three and Ezekiel thirty eight? Like, is there anything else other than like things that are happening in the tribulation time frame? Like you know, between now and then that we think may come around, but th I'd love to dig into that with you, but we, we're, we're running out of time today, but uh, thank you so much for talking to me because, so when I, when I do this and I talk to somebody who's just like on fire and you, you know so much, it just, it, it ignites me. It helps me to, um, I don't know, strengthens my faith and it makes me just, you know, that there, there's, I'm not the only crazy person out there, you no. know, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and we're it not all, crazy, it all know, goes but, smooth i mean yeah, it's consistent yeah. that's what i appreciate yeah, truth yeah, by definition I, is consistent yeah and iron sharpens iron it's that whole yep. thing you know we we work and sometimes we can grade on each other and stuff like that because we'll have different beliefs and things and i think we need to be flexible on that too that yeah. you know hey i don't quite agree with you on this but we're still brothers you know yep. we're still we're absolutely absolutely yeah, yeah.
So, anyways, thank you, Mondo. Thank you so much. Thanks yeah. for uh, this one and the last time we talked. Uh, these are going to be a great podcast. I hope I hope people that hear this get as much out of it as I did. Yeah, so really, it's been fun. Just yeah, and, reach and out anytime. The, and that's the, that's the the beauty of this. It's fun. You know, it it, it's enjoyable to to do to to make these. So, so. Anybody who wants to get and, and Mondo's got all kinds of stuff out there. Like you said, you've done articles. There's a ton of videos out there, and you talk to some of the people that are like cutting edge. They really know. Like Bill Gonzalez knows. He knows Psalm 83. He's digging in so much into Ezekiel 38, and into like the not the logistic, but what's what is the whole scene? Like who's the players? Where's players. it happening? What's gonna happen? What do we think? So, and and not just him, but there's so many people out there. Uh, you know, uh, Billy Crone is, uh, is Crone. a great one as far great. as apologetics about things. I mean, yep. he did, he's dug so much into the rapture that he's a great one. And yep. there's, there's to, so many. I get to interview people. all these guys. It's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Anyway, so definitely go check out prophecywatchers.com, uh, YouTube, the Prophecy Watchers YouTube channel. You guys are probably everywhere else too, right? Yeah, we're all over the place. You're all like over the place. Rumble, Roku, you know, yep. television. But yeah, if you start there, you get to see where it see us. But the the stuff that we, are, I would say, our stuff hits our YouTube channel probably the fastest. Um, we just we have so many subscribers there that that we kind of put it there, and then some things we record don't don't hit television for a few months. Yeah, yeah, and then it goes out from there and stuff. And there's some great books on the Prophecy Watcher. I'm kind of like you. I like books. My wife, even more. We have more books than we know what to do with. Yeah. Um, so, And there's some great deals and specials on there. And DVDs, because yeah. sometimes I like to watch the DVDs versus read. But A lot of people want, want that more. They're like, you know, I don't want to read a book. And so, you know, Bill Solace and I, we did one on Ezekiel 38, and then yeah. we did this other one on pre-tribulation and several other things. So we're doing a lot more that way because people want to just listen, which is, and we have PowerPoints, and it's all very well oh, done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. good stuff. It's not just two people talking like this. There's, yep. there's, there's images, you know, graphics, pictures, yeah, pictures, images. Yeah, it's all good stuff. So definitely check out Mondo uh, Gonzalez at prophecywatchers.com and the YouTube Prophecy Watchers channel. I'd shake your hand if I could, but <laughs> thank you all so right, much man. for doing this. And uh, until the next time, until the next uh, Strong Men of God, po Strong Men of God podcast. That's hard to say really fast. Thank you all very much, and God bless.